Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the panel on addressing the World Dreamers Trilema. Today with us, we have uh, Dr. Andrew Reddy. He is a senior member of the technical staff at Sandia National Laboratories and a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of California, uh, Berkeley, where he works on projects related to nuclear arms control, cybersecurity, and war gamer. Andrew is currently... Um, Currently, a Bridging the Gap New Era Fellow. Maybe you'll explain to us what that is exactly. Um, <laughs> Hans J. Ma uh, Morgenthau Fellow at the uh, Notre Dame University and a uh, Krivak Center non resident fellow at Marine Corps University. His work has been published in uh, Science, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, and the Journal of Cyber Policy, among other outlets. Um, also, with us, we have Dr. Ruby. Uh, Dr. Ruby Booth uh, is a cybersecurity researcher specializing in the interaction between human uh, behavior and cybersecurity. Uh, her research interests include works on hacker motivation, infosec culture, and the effect of uh, security breaches on user behavior. She has a PhD in business administration with a concentration in MIS. Dr. Booth is a principal member of the technical staff at Sandia National Laboratory where she serves as national security systems analyst and cybersecurity subject matter expert. Her areas of interest include cyber risk management, consequent assessment, and cyber deterrence investment strategy. Welcome, and I'll let you take it away. Perfect. Thanks so much, Gordon, for that kind kind introduction. Uh, I'm going to share my screen, uh, and hopefully this works, and uh, we will we will get ourselves started. As the as the banner points out. Um, uh, we know we don't speak on behalf of Sandia National Labs. We're, you're here purely in a uh, personal capacity, and obviously the views expressed by ourselves represent uh, our, our views and not those of Sandia or or USG. Um, so hopefully we're sharing with PowerPoint and going to full screen. Perfect. Uh, so we're we're delighted to to share with you a presentation that's actually born out of a paper. Um, that was solicited by some colleagues at the Naval War College for an edited volume uh, really focused on cyber war gaming. And kind of what we were asked to do was to kind of provide an overview of the state of the field when it comes to academic uh, cyber war gaming. So those games that are trying to think about how to do analysis on, uh, on cyber warfare and cyber security challenges. Um, and so what you're seeing are, are kind of the fruits of that labor. Um, and so uh, what I'm going to do here uh, with, with Ruby is kind of outline the, the kind of the challenge as we see it, um, talk a little bit about wargaming methods against other uh, kind of social science data generating process or processes or what I call DGPs, um, talk about the wargame designer's trilemma where I'm going to pitch it over to Ruby, um, and then we'll talk through three cases or examples uh, of the wargame designer's trilemma at play inside of existing uh, war game designs. Uh, and then at the end, we'll kind of blue sky a little bit and talk about where we think uh, war gaming is a particularly useful analytical tool for, uh, you know, ans asking and answering various questions that we're interested in in terms of international security, uh, strategic studies, etc. cetera. Um, I don't envision us taking us the whole hour, um, but really look forward to kind of running through the presentation for 20, 25 minutes or so, uh, and then opening up to Q and A uh, at the at the at the conclusion. Uh, so with that, let's let's get started. Um, so one of the the major challenges that that we face as national security analysts or international security analysts is that some of the, a lot of the questions that we're asked uh, exist in the realm where we don't have empirical data. Um, and so, for example, when we were asked the question of, well, how does a new military capability X impact strategic stability, or how would employing doctrine Y uh, impact the likelihood of conflict escalation. Um, you know, it's, it's, those are very difficult questions because the kind of the modal way that you would ask and answer these types of questions would be to go out into the world and collect data, right? Uh, whether that's in the form of, you know, large scale data sets like the correlates of war and mids, or in terms of doing a, you know, a comparative case analysis, um, or even just looking at historical events, uh, although one might argue that the Cuban Missile Crisis at this point is fairly overdone. Um, you know, that, that's the kind of the way that you would usually deal with these issues. Uh, but of course, here with these types of questions, you can't, right? Because we don't have uh, empirical data. And I think one of the exciting things from 
from our team's perspective is that we see the opportunity for war games to really play a role in filling filling this gap and, and ways in which we can kind of uh, use war games outside of the kind of traditional lens uh, to actually think about uh, performing causal inference. Uh, and so that's kind of uh, the, the, the pitch that's gonna be happening uh, here. So, so what we're going to do is introduce the war game designer trilemma. Um, you know, trying to kind of summarize the design challenges uh, that that we've faced in the design of our various war game uh, war game projects. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the the value of analytical war gaming approaches. Um, you know, I don't think I need to tell this audience that it's a pretty lively debate between the science of the art or the craft of wargaming. And, you know, I think certainly we're representatives of the science, but certainly see a lot of space for the art and the craft. Uh, and so happy to talk about that uh, in, in Q&A as well. Um, like I said, we'll interrogate some examples of analytical wargaming. Uh, and then, you know, I think one of the things that this presentation is, is and the volume it's a part of is trying to inspire is a serious conversation amongst war game designers focused on the cyber domain, but also across other domains uh, about the laboratory effects of the worlds that, that we're building uh, inside of these uh, inside of these war games. Um, you know, unfortunately, for, for a variety of reasons, from classification issues to intellectual property issues, uh, you know, we haven't been able to really interrogate to say the deltas between a three player game and a 10 player game, the deltas between an analog game and a digital game. And, you know, and, and for the method to be taken seriously as an analytical tool, that laboratory effects discussion needs to be had. Uh, and we need to kind of go, go through our design systematically and look at how the various design decisions are actually impacting player behavior and subsequently the data that you're getting out of uh, out of these uh, these environments, um, the volume that it's coming from, like I mentioned, it's it's Frank Smith, Nina Kohlers, and Ben Schechter that are putting it together, um, and and hopefully that'll be coming out uh, in in fairly short order. Okay, so let's back up uh, for a second. So I mentioned that the way that we would traditionally carry out research with regards to national security problems are you know taking advantage of empirical or observational data. Um, so it is the case that scholars uh, and analysts like ourselves have attempted to get around this dearth of empirical data challenge in the past. Um, you know, I think it's fair, probably fair to say that if you look at things like War on the Rocks uh, or Lawfare or, 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 or what have you, that you'll see a lot of kind of theoretical approaches to these problems um, that don't really delve into empirics, but there, but there are those of us that have tried to, to delve into kind of creating synthetic data generating processes or environments to, to analyze these issues. And so, you know, I think some that are probably close, you know, fairly analogous to, to what we do, um, you know, are formal models and computer-based simulations, right? So, you know, those are those are really useful tools that have been around for a very long time to kind of generate data. I think one of the major problems that we face in the national security realm in using these methods is that often they take the human out of the equation. Uh, and for at least a subset of questions that we get asked, the human is really important, right? So if you're getting asked, you know, hey, when's an individual likely to uh, decide to escalate a conflict? You know, human human decision making and all of our you know deeply held cognitive biases, et cetera, are really going to impact that decision making process. So abstracting the human outside of the the model is 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 a pretty significant problem um, that you know we've tried to address in a variety of other ways in the field. So uh, survey experiments kind of fix the oversimplification problem uh, and you know there's no need to assume things like rationality uh, on the part of participants uh, but of course the problem with survey experiments is that I give you a piece of paper uh, and then 10 minutes later I take it back from you um, or maybe I'll put it on a browser uh, that's that's more common these days um, but there's no guarantee that in your 10 minutes that you've you know internalized the treatment that I was interested in testing uh, or or two that you've actually really cared a whole lot about your responses uh, indeed, um, you know, there's no there's no cost to you bubbling in A or B or C on a, on a survey, uh, and so that 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 makes it that's fairly problematic. Uh, some of our some of our work tries to deal with some of these kind of challenges associated with these synthetic DGPs, and it's where we think wargaming has a pretty significant role to play. Uh, and so our experimental wargaming work uh, that that you know we first broached with our signal wargame design. Um, 
you know, it, it has the, the best bits of being able to capture complexity like computer-based simulation, uh, you know, has formalism in, insofar as, you know, we have data that we can go and analyze using regression-based methods or hazard models or what have you. Um, and, all, and importantly, has the, the human being front and center uh, as part of the as part of the DGP, uh, and you know, creates an immersive environment where there's real cost to the actions that you're taking. Of course, all games have the challenge that they end, right? And that's what's going to make a war game different from reality. All ends up. Uh, of course, we deal with that analytically by doing things like an analysis by round and dropping the last round of play to account for the fact that it's not iterative uh, and what have you. Um, but but we see a lot of space for war games to fill in some of the gaps for these DGPs, and indeed uh, we're no longer alone. You know, there's lots of colleagues from Jackie Schneider at Hoover to Eric Lynn Greenberg at MIT um, who have recognized uh, the potential strengths of this method and are applying it to you know long-held national and international security challenges, uh, which is quite exciting. Um, of course, you know I don't tell, need to tell this audience that you know war gaming methods have been around for a very long time. Uh, their training and education applications are well established, particularly inside of the PME. Um, and also obviously in the academic context, I know in my classes uh, that I teach at Berkeley, I, I often use uh, you know many war games in order to try to explain concepts like deterrence that might be difficult to grasp if you're reading shelling for the first time or what have you. Um, additionally, you know war games have been used analytically. Um, by the likes of CNA, RAND, Naval War College, inside of, of, of DOD and in government, uh, indeed in governments across the globe, uh, both Britain and Canada have fairly, uh, fairly mature uh, war game communities inside of uh, their respective governments. Um, I think one of the things that it's probably fair to say about traditional war game designs used for an anal analysis is that, you know, they're really focused on specific policy challenges whether it's a Baltic Sea scenario or a China, South China Sea scenario, um, or looking at um, missile defense capabilities in, in Western Europe. Um, there's, there's kind of a specific uh, context within which the, the game is being designed. Um, and then oftentimes you'll have large game staff supporting those, those war games and in-depth preparation. I mean, it's not unusual to see briefing books that are novel length, right? In order to try to suture their players inside of the game environments. Uh, and often these games involve high-level policymakers, a lot of current officials, uh, probably more former officials uh, inside of inside of those uh, in environments. Of course, <clears throat> these traditional kind of analytical uses of war gaming represent a challenge. I think that one of the things that uh, that, that I certainly struggle with, um, I won't I won't speak for Ruby, uh, but I'll let her weigh in. Uh, that I struggle with when I see one-shot war games used for analytical purposes is that there's no way to guard against idiosyncratic findings, whether the idiosyncrasies are driven by the war game design, who you're playing it with, or the fact that you've got a very specific white cell. Uh, and indeed, it's only the rare war game that gets played more than once or twice. Um, and so that's a pretty significant problem. And indeed, replication is not something that a lot of traditional war game designers care about, right? Um, I think that it's, it's absolutely fair to use uh, war games that are one shot analytically to ask questions that are process oriented, which is to say that you can ask questions like, well, what topics are, you know, being brought up by policymakers around the board? Um, is this particular issue germane to the discussion? Is this particular issue not right? That's a perfectly reasonable outcome for, sorry, finding, uh, for, for that kind of war game design. Uh, what's not appropriate is saying, well, we played a war game and this is what happened. So this is what's likely to happen in the real world. Um, you know, you, yeah. you need, oh yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah. yeah so it's like totally agree. And, and also this is something that, um, in, in a talk that I gave yesterday, I was talking a little bit about how, uh, analytical war gaming can, can feed into models and simulations and qualitative wargaming can feed into an analytical wargaming. So we're not at all saying that a single shot can't have interesting findings. Uh, you know, in, in many fields, the qualitative realm is where you build initial theory. You, you find out, um, you know, some things that are, that are happening that look, look unusual or, or that seem to speak to something. And then you move into this analytical space into a more positive space positivist space to really dig into that and see whether or not it is idiosyncratic. Because I think that we've all experienced um, war games that we we were aware were driven by the personalities in the room. But, but if we can use both in concert, 
uh, and sort of you know hold hands between the methods, then then we have this opportunity to really strengthen uh, our overall community and and the research that we come come out of um, these games with. So it's very exciting. Perfect. Yeah. So, so you can tell Ruby and I are on the same team. Um, that that's exactly right. Um, so some of the things that that we've tried to to deal with in in our own war game designs is you know trying to deal with you know trying to create designs that don't have white cell adjudication, for example, to try to overcome some of these analytical concerns. Um, you know, making sure that our research questions are interesting enough such that if we find one finding in the, say, the positive direction, that's interesting. If we find the finding in the negative direction, that's also interesting. Uh, trying to make sure that we're overcoming any sponsorship bias concerns. Uh, and I think most most important is that, you know, the the data issues that we have with kind of traditional wargaming is, is a pretty significant hurdle that needs to be overcome by our community. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've worked war games on the rapporteur side, as we can imagine, and now on the design side too. And, you know, one of the challenges that we have with say in-person TTX is using rapporteurs is that, you know, our rapporteurs are excellent, but, you know, they're collect they're, there's a bias insofar as what's getting collected, right? Uh, and data collection can be incidental. And so uh, thinking hard about the pathway through which you're getting from war game design to war game getting played to data being collected from that war game is really important. Uh, and then in, and then in, in concert to the challenge that I was suggesting was earlier was something that we as a community need to face is this laboratory effects issue. So data from war games are, are often cloistered, particularly in the USG context. Uh, and war game designs are often treated as intellectual property. And what happens when when this is occurring is that you know there's no way to do things like peer review on war game design or to think about well if you had built the war game to be four player rather than two player how would it have changed the dynamics and how might it have changed the findings um, and so one of the things that we've done in our work is actually publish the game manuals in the hopes that members of the community will actually pick it up and try you know slight variations on the design are able to do that um and and you know really drive at these uh th these sets of questions um and so you know just just a just a pitch for the kind of thinking about it analytically you know i think there's a lot of space for us to think about how to bring causal inference into the story how to bring generalizability of findings into the story uh and, and get focus on replication um you know, and in a lot of ways, as Ruby as Ruby points out, I think we see you know our particular approach as being uh, an additional tool in the toolkit, both for wargaming and social science research. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with the ways in which we've been doing TTXs for the better part of 60, 70 years. Um, this is another another tool in our toolkit to kind of uh, adjudicate these these you know these pretty difficult. Uh, national and international security questions. Similarly, for social science, you know, we're not advocating that wargaming replace survey experiments or that it replace formal models, right? It's that it's an add add on to the the kind of the existing uh, existing tools in the toolkit. Uh, I think one of the things that I will say though is is amongst the DGPs, war games, as as I think I'll be have a sympathetic audience for this and amongst the connections crew, you know, war games are amazing insofar as they're so good at allowing us to dial up the complexity and really look at uh, some of the gnarly challenges inside of these security questions uh, that, that maybe you don't get from a survey experiment or, or a formal model where you have to make so many assumptions uh, to actually build an analytically tenable uh, framework. So, so as we're um, kind of thinking about, um, you know, our, our our own war game design process, um, in terms of in terms of framing the paper, uh, we we ended up coming up with this kind of war game designers uh, trilemma in, in in kind of thinking about uh, what what types of things we might be worried about. So, Ruby, if it's okay with you, I'm going to pitch it over to you to kind of take us through uh, this slide right here. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, what we found was that as we sat around collectively, having come from different game design backgrounds, um, that, that we tend to, particularly in um, in analytical war games, although to a certain extent it's true in qualitative war games where you want uh, to have findings that speak to theory, um, that we have these sort of three prongs of a triangle. Um, so you have the analytical utility that you're shooting for. Um, you have the engaging play, and then you have contextual realism. So I'm going to explain 
sort of what I mean by those things. Um, so analytical utility, uh, you know, obviously to have a successful experiment, you need, um, you need it to be a relatively uh, simple uh, set of conditions, right? Because any additional uh, complexity that you add is a potential compound. It can mute effects, it can affect the, you know, it can require that you have more participants because your power decreases. There's there's a lot of areas where we make choices in order to get to analytical utility that, that sort of run counter to the other two. And so these are all trade-offs and, and any game is sort of within this, the plane of this triangle. So contextual realism. Well, when we make games, we have to make choices about how realistic to make them. So, you know, there is, um, there is a level of abstraction that we do. There's a level of fidelity that we choose to have or not have a, according to which aspects of the real world we're going to include, because obviously games are never perfectly contextually realistic, right? We don't put people on real fields and, and have them move real tanks. Uh, and so we have to come up with a way to make things realistic enough to get to the, the answers that we want so that we're not losing some kind of key characteristic of the scenario that would drive behavior. Uh, but on the other hand, we can't have it be perfectly realistic because one, it's a game, but two, because you know, perfect realism isn't very interesting for players. So that sort of brings in this engaging play concept, this idea that the one of the arguments that we consistently make as a group, um, and I think is true in the larger community, is that one of the ways that war games are better than surveys is that they're engaging. People invest in the games, they suture themselves into the story of the game, and they really care about outcomes. So, you know, obviously that's a, uh, that's a curve or a spectrum, but but ultimately we wanna make games that are engaging, that are that are fun to play, at least to the extent that they get people's attention and people really devote themselves to the game outcomes. And so if we if we make the games too simple, if we make them so realistic that, that they get bogged down in, uh, you know, and oh my God, I've got to get grain to these troops. And, you know, we make it so complicated that, it, that it's not fun. Then we lose that benefit that is one of the incredible strengths of wargaming, which is that people care. You care about what the outcome is. You care about what happens to, to the the country that you're playing or to the troops that you're playing in a really meaningful way. And so these trade-offs really structured, um, the, you know, our, our approach to the idea that there are trade-offs between each of these, a really structured our approach. Perfect. Thanks, Ruby. And I just want to make clear that, you know, there's no, we're, we're trying to create a substantive heuristic, right, upon which we can place different game designs uh, and think about the various trade-offs that designers are making. There's no kind of, at least from our perspective, no right or textbook level of, you know, fidelity, complexity, abstraction. And there's no kind of, there's no place on this simplex that is ideal. Uh, I think that ultimately what we need to do when we're doing game design is is peg it to the research question that we're trying to answer, right? And then design appropriately inside of the, inside of this simplex. Uh, but just to make it very clear, there's no kind of normative judgment that we should be hewing more closely to contextual realism or engaging play or or analytical. Uh, utility. And indeed, even inside of the data generating process that I mentioned before, we can put those on, on this simplex as well, right? Obviously, in the real world, we don't care about engaging play uh, and simulations and models that are inside of computer. That's also not a concern. But you certainly see movement up and down this, this axis between analytical utility, right, where the data that I'm collecting from the real world is likely to be messy, it's going to require cleaning, uh, and subsequently choices that I have to make about kind of well, which cells get included and which cells do not. Um, and then obviously simulation and modeling, right? It has none of those hygiene concerns. It's built with analytical, analytical utility in mind. Uh, similarly, survey experiments are also uh, tend to be built with analytical utility. Um, I don't know how many of you have been subject to one of my survey experiments, but it's probably not super fun, uh, at least not compared to a war game. Uh, and, and of course, that's going to be somewhere else on the simplex. Uh, and then traditional war games, right, often are very concerned with engaging play, um, very concerned with contextual realism, but not necessarily so concerned with analytical utility um as as some of the other dgps i think one of the things that that you obviously like about our our experimental or analytical wargaming approach is that it kind of it can be something of a goldilocks solution and it can be moved up and down uh the the simplex as 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 desired 
Um, and that, that can be also true of, of survey experiments and traditional war games too. But, uh, but just to say that this trilemma is particularly nice because you can actually put DG, other DGPs on top of it uh, as well. And so, you know, what, what, what we've done with the, the war game designers trilemma here is use it as, as a way to kind of look at the state of the field uh, when it comes to academic cyber war gaming and place some of the more well-known cyber war games and think about the kind of design decisions that, uh, that, that are made. Um, and, and again, not to say that the, so I, I, we're looking at the ICWG war game, which I'm sure a lot of you have played uh, that was led up by Ben, uh, Jackie and Rachel uh, at the Never War College in Hoover, um, Island Intercept from Ben Jensen and Davey Banks uh, and the Cyber Escalation Exercise from Brandon Bloriano and Ben Jensen. Um, and, you know, it's not to say that again, like those game designs that hew more close to the analytical utility are better, right? That's not what the exercise is. The exercise is to kind of look at the various design trade-offs between them in order to kind of identify, well, hey, these are the types of laboratory effects that we as a community really should be paying attention to. Uh, so for example, um, the ICWG work game um, is designed specifically with analytical utility in mind. Um, you know, I, Fortunately for me, I got to be around at the kind of the beginnings of that project and really saw the degree to which um, they were really concerned about, you know, what kind of inference they were likely to be able to draw from the data that was uh, coming out of, of the war game. Uh, it avoids the use of real world nations and geographies. Uh, and indeed, our own work does that too. Um, I, I can't be certain if they beta tested, but certainly in our work on Signal, uh, beta testing that as soon as we put blue and red in the game or gave them country monikers, um, all of a sudden we had players caricaturing what they thought a Russia would do or what a China would do rather than actually dealing with the core strategic problem inside the game environment. And so if you really care about your research questionnaire and, and answering it in an agnostic, in a way that's agnostic to real world dynamics, right, that, that's, a, that's a really you know, important choice that gets made. Uh, of course, it also leads to the charge that you're losing external validity because you're not reflecting the real world. Um, they also have a one-sided game design, so there's no strategic interaction inside of ICWG. Uh, it's, it's you know, player versus scenario, um, and adversary behavior is predetermined and prescribed by the scenario. So it doesn't matter uh, what you do in round one, you're getting the same round two. And obviously that's to make it analytically tenable. Uh, but on the flip side, right, it might decrease the, you know, the, the player engagement, if you will, uh, as players realize that the actions that they're taking don't, don't actually impact uh, the game result. Um, so, so, you know, we, we kind of put ICWG somewhere, you know, between focusing on analytical utility, not super close to engaging play or, or, or contextual realism. Um, Island Intercept, um, almost the complete opposite. Uh, so it takes us into the real world. There's a South China Sea scenario, uh, really focused on strategic interaction between Beijing and Washington. Um, and you know, certainly that leads to the potential for caricaturing, uh, but, but ultimately you know, they were saying, okay, we want to really get close to, to, to how, you know, how these dynamics might be playing out in, in the real world. Um, their treatment of cyber capabilities was pretty interesting. Um, they, they kind of created abstract cyber capability in the form of playing cards. Um, and we can have an argument as to, you know, kind of whether the way in which they did that was, uh, you know, too abstract or not abstract enough uh, and what have you. Um, but, but it was really kind of interesting uh, design choice there. Uh, and one of the things that they do that we also do in our work that I think is particularly valuable is that they take the war game data and use it as the basis upon which to run a series of survey experiments. Uh, and so that's what uh, that we've done in, in, in some of our work as well. Uh, and I think it's a particularly interesting way of thinking about it. Uh, so here, right, you have Island Intercept hewing much more closely to the contextual realism side of things, much more closely to, to engaging play, but maybe more, more difficult to achieve analytical tractability um, with the caveat, of course, that they have these survey experiments that are trying to, to kind of provide that uh, to them. On the uh, the final the final example, the cyber escalation exercise. Um, again, the primary emphasis uh, is on analytical utility. Um, again, there's no strategic interaction. Um, so, if if a, if a war game is only a war game when you have strategic interaction, right? That's uh, you know an interesting uh, kind of uh, design choice. Um, the designers lean heavily on the use of briefing packets that approximate documents from the U.S. National Security Council. Uh, to try to drive uh, some some level of contextual realism, 
Um, again, you know, we can we can make a we can have an argument about whether if you have non-US players, that type of design choice is appropriate or not. But but again, a really interesting way of kind of thinking about how to bring some of that contextual realism into uh, into the analytical framework. Uh, and then um, the game the game actually ends after one round. Um, and so again, you you don't have that kind of cost to a particular action or benefit associated with a particular action that you would get more on the engaging play side. Um, so so there you know you you have that trade off again. And and just I probably said this enough, but this is again it's not that we're saying that these are good versus bad choices. They are just different choices. And so if you're comparing if you're looking at cyber war games, I think one of the things we're trying to tell you is hey, look, there's a lot of variation here in what these things actually look like. Uh, and so that variation is really important for us to understand. Um, I, I won't belabor this point, right? There's a there's variation in a diversity approaches um, that, that, that are here. And indeed, all three of these games, um, with the potential exception of the Schneider et al. and the Valeriana and Jensen, are interested in slightly different questions, right? Uh, uh, the, 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 those two games are really focused on conflict escalation. Um, so, so where, where might, uh, you know, these types of, um, trade-offs be, be apparent and where analytical wargaming might be particularly useful. Um, so from our perspective, you know, in any situation where empirical data is scarce, um, or otherwise unobservable and where human behavior and shooting interaction are central to the research, uh, question, you know, we, we think that this is a really, you know, useful method for us to, to be looking at as a field. Um, so just to throw out some examples, um, gray zone operations, crisis decision making, cyber warfare, when you're dealing with new or nascent military capabilities, when you're dealing with new strategies, um, right, all of all of these, uh, you know, are perfectly reasonable places to, to kind of consider this, um, this method that, you know, from, from my perspective, hasn't been used enough. Um, so, so where is our team going? Uh, some of you might know our portfolio from, from Signal uh, and the projects on nuclear gaming, where we were really focused on nuclear capabilities and how that might impact the likelihood of nuclear use. Um, our current project, or, or, or next project, I guess, uh, as framed here, uh, is looking at the question of cyber deterrence. Um, you know, certainly in the, in the cyber warfare field, there's a lot of discussion about cyber deterrence and whether it's a thing or not. Uh, and again, a lot of that commentary is largely theoretical with no data. Uh, and so, you know, we're building a, a war game where we try to try to test uh, whether uh, cyber deterrence is actually a phenomenon and if it is, what its dynamics are. So we ask kind of two related uh, research questions. Uh, we look at under what conditions players are more likely to make deterrent threats uh, and compare across domains. So are they more likely to make deterrent threats in cyberspace versus uh, the conventional domain? Uh, and then looking at under what conditions, uh, given a deterrent threat being made, deterrence failure is more or less likely. Uh, so it could be the case that, you know, players have no problem at all making cyber, you know, cyber threats, uh, but they just don't work. Um, and so we're looking at kind of both sides of that coin. Uh, and we're really interested, obviously, on the domain, but we're also interested in the specificity of the threat, right? So, you know, what's the type of cyber attack that I'm likely to launch? What's the target of that cyber attack? Um, those are the types of things that uh, that you know the, the we're pushing on, and uh, and I believe Kieran's actually uh, Kieran Lakaraji, our colleague at Sandia, will be presenting uh, this Tracing House project, um, or already has. Yeah, I can't remember whether it was yesterday or tomorrow. Um, but if you want to hear more about that work, more than happy to follow up. Um, lots of good sources. I should expect Peter and and Phil are, are right up there uh, amongst a variety of others. Um, but with that, I will. Um, uh, stop sharing and uh, welcome uh, folks' um, questions. Or actually, Ruby, maybe I should give you a final word if there's anything you want to add. No, I think we can go to questions. I'm happy to, to open up discussion for any of the aspects of the trilemma, the game, how we uh, how we approach the DGP part uh, of analytical wargaming. Whatever you got, we're happy to, to field. Perfect. And I'm actually going to X out of this because I want to be able to see people if if they're chatting. And I can't do that on my machine, apparently. There we go. Uh, Gordon, I think you're muted. Gordon, you're muted. Sorry about that. 
Thank you, Dr. Reddy and Dr. Booth. Um, there is one question which I believe you've already seen in the chat um, and that Adam said he put up on the bubble. Um, so the question... This is from early on. This came early on in the talk. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Andrew, I can take this unless you, you want to jump on it. Go for it. All right. Yeah. So there are a few things about this. One is that, uh, of course, that's a concern. Um, one of the ways that we um, we deal with it in experimental war game design is is through just the, the experimental effect, right? So the uh, the presence of an observer doesn't change across the two treatments. I mean, across the treatment versus the control. So so we do control for it in an experimental design, sort of intrinsically. But I think it's a really good point around. Um, qualitative war games and war games in general is this idea of observers and of even of informal observers. So even if you don't have a person out uh, out in the, um, separate from the game, we're, we're viewing each other. And one of the things that I consider a lot about, um, I'm getting a little bit of an echo, I'm not sure if, um, if somebody needs to mute, but in any event, um, I'm getting, um, the, getting to the point there that, um, the reputational effect and interaction effects between people are really important in war games. Um, and something that it's a laboratory effect that we probably need to study in greater detail. We do know that observation, that, that the presence of observers has a meaningful effect on, um, on human behavior, right? People tend to give answers that they think you're going to want. And that's true in survey experiments too. So the way that I approach it is, is I think threefold. One, um, you know, we do tend to focus in our team on experimental war game design, which which mitigates that effect. Secondly, I think that it's important to design games that um, where you're going to run them frequently enough uh, that you can get kind of um, information that uh, so that one observer effect might can be canceled out by another observer effect. But finally, we have this problem in many of the things that we do. So we have um, we have the problem when we look at survey experiments, for example. Uh, it's slightly different. It's not so much an observer effect in the classical sense as it is an observer effect around the idea that um, that I'm going to give you the answer you want. Uh, but but that is something that matters. And so as we move forward as a discipline, um, you know, I mean, as a as a methodology and as a field, I think it's really important that we tackle these laboratory effects head on. I, if you see me in any of the other things uh, over the course of the week, you'll hear me say this, I think in every single talk, instead of hoping that we avoid, uh, you know, that we can kind of dodge them, let's let's look at them, let's study them, let's see what significance they're likely to have or what impact they're likely to have and address it head on. Awesome. I mean, yeah, completely, completely agree. And just to pull one of the threads that, that Ruby mentioned with regards to interaction effects, one of the things that that our team is really keen on looking at down the road is that we built games that tend to be individual versus individual, right? And we know from beta testing, particularly Signal, when we got to take it around to various, um, you know, PME institutions that, you know, when we played the game 3v3, 4v4, the dynamics shifted a touch. And that was really interesting. And different teams attacked the game dynamics differently, right? So for example, some teams created their own little hierarchical structure, usually based on who was older or who was not, right? And other teams are really egalitarian about it, right? And, and in reality, when we're looking at national security problems, that's a team-based problem, right? And so there's a lot of space, I think, for war games to kind of push on this team dynamic. Um, of course, we didn't do it with Signal because to be honest, we needed something tenable and usable in short order, right? And getting teams to work, particularly online, uh, can be difficult. Um, you got to bear in mind that we built Signal pre-COVID, so you know distributed or online wargaming wasn't a thing, uh, and getting folks older than 30 was actually a challenge for us. Uh, maybe less of a challenge now in in this COVID environment, if there is a silver lining. Uh, but that's something that you know our team's really interested in. So just want to pull that thread that that uh, that Ruby mentioned there. Sorry, Gordon, you're muted again, I think. <laughs> I do myself because I'm not sure if I'm the person providing <laughs> feedback or not when, when people are getting a feedback uh, on the thing. If the speakers from the, uh, the monitor are what's uh, causing that issue. Uh, there's a question, if both of you can look at the question private chat, it's right along to explain about cyber versus nuclear.
Adam put it up in the private chat because it's well, it's a little long to. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so Adam's question there, uh, with respect to deterrence um, in in cyberspace, cyber weapons may be, you know, one shots, use it or lose it, um, and, and nuclear is is maybe a little bit different in that regard. That's exactly why there's a, this theoretical debate, right? Um, you know, I think for from our perspective, we see kind of two potential capability, what we call a capability communication trade off, right? As as you kind of uh, make a deterrent threat. Uh, in, in the cyber domain, there's the the potential for a, what we call a muting driver, right? So if I communicate my my cyber threat, now I'm opening up the potential for my adversary to defend against it. Uh, and then there's a mirroring driver, right? By communicating a potential capability, you might be inducing your adversary to actually copy it and use it against you. Um, and and so you know, absolutely, these are the types of things that that we hope to push on using a wargaming methodology because we see this litany of good theoretical work, right? Um, we're not here to bash like the theoretical work that's being done around cyber deterrence. It's just that that debate exists in the theoretical realm when in reality it needs to operate in the empirical realm. And so, you know, in the, given the dearth of, of empirical data associated with cyber attacks uh, and which could happen for a variety of reasons, right? Um, you know, and on the academic side, we our data sets are full of DDoS attacks, usually from non-state actors. That's not a surprise, right? That's a selection effect. Um, but given the lack of empirical data, we see a lot of space for, um, for wargaming methods to actually adjudicate uh, whether this kind of one shot, use it or lose it dynamic is really, uh, is really happening. And indeed, it is the case for countries with small nuclear arsenals that it uses lose the dynamics may also be, uh, you know, at play. Um, and that still might be qualitatively or categorically different than the cyber challenge. Uh, and so, you know, there's, there's no shortage of really interesting, difficult questions for us as a national security establishment to ask and answer. Uh, and I think both Ruby and I see a lot of space for this method to, to be able to do that. Yes, Jeff, just to clarify, that question was from the uh, Discord channel, not from Adam. He was only putting it on. Oh, here. perfect. <laughs> um. Another question from the uh, Discord channel. Uh, see if Adam, before we uh, type in it, Adam has put it in. This is again from the Discord channel. So I would say not. Um, so to, to read the question, uh, is the conflict between engaging play and realism simply the result of trying to test too, mel too many elements at once? Um, that would, in my mind, be the conflict between analytical utility and engaging play, where you may try to test too many things at once um, and uh, you know, wind up in a space where, where the game is, you know, where you lose power and you have to have a larger end. Um, but from a realistic a realism standpoint, we really look at that as a level of abstraction issue. So, um, you know, you can have a conflict between contextual realism and engaging play, even absent, uh, you can have that in a hobby game. Um, and the point that I'm sort of making here is that it's not that we're saying it's not realistic. We're saying the level of detail, the contextual realism, the level of nuance that you include can become an obstacle to engaging play. So you can have, for instance, extremely realistic squad based games that deal with things like individual troop movement and uh, and supplies. Um, and that can be engaging and have contextual realism. Um, but you've chosen a level of abstraction around what realism, you know, how deep into that realism you go. You can imagine the same, you know, if you expanded that game to be a, you know, a nation versus nation uh, game at a very high strategic level, and now you're having to feed and supply every troop. That is true. That is realistic, right? We, we have to do that. But um, but it wouldn't make for a very engaging play because it winds up just being overwhelming. And so, I mean, I do think that too many elements at once is a really good way of, of pointing out the problem. Uh, but, but yeah, and I do want to make that, that point. We're not saying that, that to have engaging play, you have to have, you know, monsters or space 
space fight. <laughs> like that's not that's not the argument we're making. You can make an incredibly realistic game, but the the level of contextual realism, the nuance that you put in, really really makes a difference in terms of how how readily available the the actions and the strategy are to to players, particularly novice players. Although that's a whole different kettle of fish. Um, question I'm going to actually uh, mention, going back to one of your early slides on the uh, how many times a game actually gets played. Uh, I come from a background in discrete event simulation where we're used to running 100 to 1,000 or more runs of a given model yep. or thing to get our distribution results. Do you think it's practical to have any of the, uh, what kind of game or what level do you have to be up to make it practical to run a game that many enough times that it would be a... Uh, uh, possible to get that kind of uh, enough thing to cover all the possible events, um, either either in terms of people iteratively playing it or in terms of spreading it out amongst enough people. Yeah, it's. I mean, pow power is always going to be a challenge, right? Um, I ultimately, it's it's. What are we comparing it against? You have a problem, right? You have a question where we don't have uh, empirical data, right? So you can do what you're suggesting, right? And run a computer simulation, but you run the risk of not actually capturing human behavior. I think the, the way that I would tend to, to push on this problem is by attacking it with multiple data generating processes, right? So in a lot of our work, we marry survey experiments to wargaming methods. Uh, and we actually have a couple of people on our team who are really interested in doing the kind of computation, right? And, and mixing that into the wargaming method. So for example, doing AI players based on the rule set or AI players based on the strategy set. Because if you think about, whoop, this way around on the screen, uh, if you think about the, the strategy set through a game, right? You have a distribution of actions through your game and across multiple games, you end up with either a bimodal distribution or one, you know, one distribution, three, right? And so you can actually start to categorize the gameplay that you're seeing inside the environment. And I think that what drives the level of N needed is how many of those strategy sets you end up having, right? If there's only one, you don't need lots of N, right? If there's a lot, right? And there's a lot of branches on that tree, then you need more. Um, what I will say is that in, in the social science field that, that I'm a part of, the, the IR field, we have a lot of scholars now I mean, nobody's getting up to the 400s of gameplay that we had for Signal, um, which I think, to the best of my knowledge, is still the largest war game data set that, that exists. But um, but you certainly see Eric Glenn Greenberg's work. He does around 30 N. Um, you know, Jayaki's work. I think they're almost. I think they're just over 100. Um, and so that's the kind of N that we're talking about, um, and, and trying to do something reasonable. Either way, right, is above the threshold of being one or two, right, uh, shot through. Well, once you get to 100, usually that's enough to be a, a practical element. But you're right. In terms of a simulation, you can only put human behavior into the extent that you can assign probabilities to exactly. the action that people do. And then there's the question of, as the game progresses, the your choice of strategies or what how desperate you are, depending on the nature of the game, may change uh, the path you're taking. Yeah. And we are, we are DGP agnostics, right? We, we want to use all the tools in the toolkit. So if you have a particular research question and you can cut at it with a formal model and you can cut at it with a war game and a survey experiment, right? And if you see the same result across all of those synthetic DGPs, that's good, right? We have a better confidence in the answer that we're getting, right? Than if you just use one method. And, and so what we saw in some of our signal work was that there, there were very subtle differences between the survey experiment and the war game, which suggests that actually putting people inside of an immersive environment and the variety of other ways that surveys are different than a war game, they might matter, right? And we, all, almost all of IR right now is just survey experiment after survey experiment. And, and that potentially is a problem um, if, if they're not capturing a ground truth, right? Do we have any further questions from people? I'm looking at the... I believe you've seen the last one I see on the uh, Discord channel. Is Adam has put it up in the uh, thing, uh, in the uh, private chat. I haven't seen any more come out. I did see a chat uh, question in the sidebar that I think Andrew might be able to speak to, which is, at what point might we have a preprint for the paper? Oh, that's a good question. Probably in the next couple of months. Uh, yeah. um, but you can fire us an email, and we can figure out if we can get it out earlier than that. Um, it's currently with the editors, um, so um, 
there'll be subtle changes, but hopefully not too many major ones. Um, in terms of like the, the broader set of folks to, to look at though, I mean, obviously our team's got a variety of papers that, that are out. Um, Reed Polly has a really nice piece that looks back at the RAND archives. Uh, John Emery has another set of, uh, of war game designs from the RAND archives. Uh, so, so those are, those are worth looking at. Um, Jackie Schneider's work. I'm a big fan of, uh, Eric Lynn Greenberg, um, Ben Schechter, Nina Kohler's, um, you know, I'm, I'm basically now just listening off my friends. Um, but, but, you know, there, there's certainly a, a growing set of scholars that are interested in the application of this method in an academic setting to national and international security questions. Um, so, so yeah, you know, I think it's, uh, it's a really neat part of the field. Um, and, um, pretty exciting uh, time to be a part of it. See the question on the uh, screen there, asking basically what re what other resources available on this topic? Yeah, those are, those were all the all the uh, yeah Jackie's work, uh, John's work, Reed's work. Um, definitely. Uh, someone else is, let's see if this is a question. Uh, it's more of a statement. Um, anyway, um, thank you very much. I'm going to wait in, uh, a minute here to see if people are typing on the Discord. I'm just waiting to see if any of them are, are questions for this, but uh, thank you very much. In any case, when we end this, there'll be uh, chat can continue on the Discord channel for after this uh, session ends. Perfect. Well, we're just very grateful to the Connections team for being yeah. able to be here. And for those of you who, who were on the Discord and able to shoot us questions, we're available um, for for follow-up. Uh, please feel free to reach out. We obviously love to talk about this stuff and would do it all day, every day, given the opportunity. So if you've got questions, let us know. Yeah, all right. Um, thank you very much, both. I think that wraps up the uh, session for this panel. Perfect. And thank you, Gordon, for moderating. Appreciate it.